started fishing here. My apologies, I had three or four little technical things that didn't work out the way I wanted. And I'm starting late, the sun is rising up there above the Golan. Just give me a little wheel around here because the next sunrise stroll and chat here might be in about two weeks time. So we'll just leave that like that for now and we'll see what other surprises we have along the way. And today we have readings for me that I like very much, especially the first reading of Elijah coming to Elisha and Elisha was plowing with following 12 yoke of oxen and Elijah throws his cloak over him and this is something I haven't thought about before but it's amazing how Elisha was so prompt in answering he did have a personal request which becomes a dramatic reference point a good 800 or so years later eight centuries later when Jesus calls somebody, no, somebody volunteers to Jesus and I guess it's Jesus called him and, and he said, let me go home first and say goodbye. And Jesus has a very, very strong answer, which leans on this story. But what impressed me today about Elisha is that he's able to go immediately. He does put in that request to go home to the family. And actually, Jesus denies that request. And that way, the evangelist highlights the new sense of transcendent, how would you say? The discovery of a reality that transcends all of that. It's just another league. A very different level but I must say in my life as a farming boy the call I had also was very easy for me to answer I had my dreams for farming for nuclear engineer teenage you know amazing dream family but I didn't have interior resistance to the call. And that's a grace. Some people have to struggle a lot to, to find uh, acceptance, to, to reach acceptance, to develop acceptance interiorly of a call from God that upsets plans. And obviously I would have that also at other moments in my life changes of plans but that first big step is a major gift of grace that I found easy to follow I didn't find an obstacle and I can relate to Alicia who was able to to leave his farm and his family and to go immediately and then he does it with also with a gesture that I kind of always poked fun at like why did he have to slaughter the oxen and burn the plows uh, to cook the meat have that farewell party why did he have to do that he could have given them to his brother <laughs> And I, I, I guess that was, a, I heard a commentary, the one there on the gospel lake said, no, it wasn't, I don't know who was commenting this. Or maybe it was, uh, yeah, I know now where it was. It was a German commentary. And the discovery of God as total consuming love. And in that sense, this resembles also then the, the um, seemingly sternness and 
seemingly harshness of Jesus' response when the young man says, I will fall, I will, I, Jesus calls him and he says, let me first go home and, and say goodbye. And so Elisha burns because God is a God of fire, the fire of love that consumes all. But not in a selfish way, in a way of total purification and total freedom. And at the end of the day, all this world in the apocalyptic vision is, is going to be completely transformed. I wonder if butterflies mourn the fact that they're no longer larvae. I doubt it. It must be amazing to be a butterfly, to be able to not crawl and fly, to be not brown and kind of ugly, and to be full of color, to bring delight to so many. The transformation we're destined to have in God, accepting his gift of love, will totally bring us to a different level. And you have it in other ways sometimes. Conquerors have burned their ships on reaching the coast of their destiny so that the soldiers wouldn't have, or the participants, the partners of the enterprise wouldn't, would have, uh, would, would no longer have that temptation to go back. He was not going to go back to his, his old possessions. That was all a preparation for where he was headed. The work, the met methodical commitment, the teamwork with the other workers on the farm, the care for the livestock, for the land, the opportunity of the seasons, all of that mastery and dominion in nature, a healthy dominion, a good dominion for good husbandry of, of what was entrusted. Uh, but that now was the past and there was a complete new future which was overriding past considerations and that just called for leaving everything and following. And we have that wonderful psalm. If I remember the number was 92. The Lord is my inheritance forever. The Lord is my inheritance. And some people unfortunately have a kind of a funny idea of God and think that's boring. But if you think of all the, if you make a list right now of all the great personalities of history that you'd like to spend time with, the great inventors, the great musicians, the great authors, the great artists, and the warmest, kindest people that existed, the people of greater spiritual insight, and you say, okay, I'd like to spend a lot of time with these people. It would be a tremendous company, especially if I had a Guinness or the right cup of tea or whatever it is you drink with delight. And the Lord is my inheritance forever. We're made for that. And all of these artists and geniuses of history, genii of history, all of these are, are just little reflections in the water here of the sun that's burning so intensely. So there I got new respect for Elisha's decision I'm sure I always had it, but I was always tempted to make fun of him and criticize why he hadn't given all that to his brother. Well, anyway, and then we have the gospel reading, which is very interesting today, about truthfulness in an age of fake news, in an age of just giving impressions, in an age of very individualistic interests, and the difficulty then of being honest and that your yes be a yes. And it's honesty in terms of saying the truth, but it's also uprightness in maintaining commitment, which also means 
when yes is spoken, yes is discerned. So the ability to, the maturity to be able to make decisions at last, and when I say yes, I mean yes, not just I need the thing you're going to give me now because you know that I've promised to do this. Well, no. My yes is a yes. There's truth in my words. My words are true. And I don't need to use a lot of uncouth language, foul language, or big, high-sounding confirmations of the truthfulness of what I say. And there we have the biblical tradition of swearing by God's name, by the temple and so forth. There's an interesting commentary on that too by our good Australian friend on the Gospel Exegesis today, Logical Bible Study. As you can, you can find that, somebody else told me you can find it on the Halo app, as in hallowed be thy name. And you have it also, I, see, I hear it on Spotify. And I find it actually very, very good, uh, consistent and re always there and quality reflections. Maybe not all of them are what speak to me at a given moment, but some, there's always something very good in those uh, reflections. So let our yes be a true yes. And that witness to truth, truth has its own capacity to convince, because it's true. And one of the problems about being untruthful is you need more untruths to cover up for it, and every one of them needs more untruths after that. So it's a, it's a downward spiral into deceit and a fake society. People, God bless you, be encouraged today, be a light in the world, and who knows where we'll see each other again, and when. Every day is a mystery of goodness, of creation, of God's gift. See you later, alligators.